So, guys, there is always this issue with the recess because when people leave, it's sometimes way harder to bring them back here. Yeah, so see that uh, we have some no-shows here. So, I will try to give a little bit of time for people that they would come on time. The only problem is that we don't have any scorings or anything, so Aww. there's no way to fail anyone. We give them a pause when they come. Or, or, or that, yes. <laughs> or, I, I mean, you know, yeah. So, guys, we're going to start on time. We're going to go back to the elements of the ecosystem. As long as, I would just go one slide back so that you guys remember where we stopped. First thing first, we talk about the definition because that's the startup part. Now we're going to talk about the ecosystem. We talked about the fact that if you really want to know if you are a part of an ecosystem, you have to remember that not everything in a part of this ecosystem has to be either alive or dead. It doesn't have to be something that is just a building and, and a piece of paper or just people that they are talking to each other from different professions. The elements that they are inside this place, some of them, they are something like in a biological ecosystem. Some of them, they are animals and bacteria and plants that to an extent they help each other to be alive. Some parts are non-living components like water and soil and atmosphere. And it's very easy for you just to look at it as a metaphor, try to understand what are those things. We try to bring an investment to a new country. The first thing that people think, how is the tax system? Uh, what is the law? Am I going to be protected if I would just try to invent what I have right now? Is it going to be something that people are just going to copy from what I have? Or there is some level of support so that people would be able to protect it so that nobody else can copy it from me? How hard is it for me to open up my own company? So many ways that you would be able to just see by somehow facilitating these interactions between the elements, you would be able to make them more and more internally connected. And the last part is a physical space. From having a place that you have for free, you would be able to listen to this presentation, you would be able to meet other people every single week. Even just having this physical space, it is going to somehow help you try to understand it. A lot of people come to Poland for developing their ideas from Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, great countries. But when your population is one million, you don't have enough customers. The overall size of the ecosystem is too small for them to be able to properly even test their idea. So this is a physical space, and that's also super important. So now imagine, you are having the right definition of what you want to do you know exactly what it means to be a part of an ecosystem. This might be a perfect idea for you to understand that what you think is not what you think. Mm -hmm. So everybody heard at some point that some great designer, innovator, designed an iPad. But the, but, the but the definition of what happened in 2001 started in 1958. It means that a pocket radio in the right definition of the innovation can transform itself to a device that can change the music industry. So you have to just somehow try to understand what I would like to do with the definition of what I mentioned in startups does not always have to be something new. You can get something that is old from another ecosystem, from another country, from another sector, and then try to make it your own. Nobody look at what you have in an Apple iPad and say, oh, I've definitely seen that. That's a pocket radio that was made in 1958. So you have to remember, innovation a lot of times comes in different forms that you only have to just see from your own eye and then try to make sure that this is going to be what I would like to do and what I would like to build. How many of you guys have ever seen this? Few of you. It's a very common slide. So. I just want to not to go too much to detail, as I mentioned, I will just try to be way more detailed about like going through the steps, what to do and what not to do with way more detail. But it's super important for you to know, if you would like to embark on the journey of your startup, these are the very generalization, very abstract steps you have to have if you really would like to have your startup. One is the tinkering part. You have a 
university, you have your own day job, you have uh, anything else that somehow try to pay the bill, and at the same time, you are thinking about the next big thing that is going to happen. It means that if you have a startup, it doesn't mean that you either have to have a nine to five job or you have to have a startup. In the first stage, you can even have both of them. As you can see, the lines are a little bit with the space with each other. Because this is where you would be able to somehow have a better understanding of what you have to do. You can go to acceleration programs in the evening. You would be able to, on Thursdays, you can come over and then try to have a better understanding of what startups are. Till you would be able to have this proper definition of the start that is this blade years. If you really look at it from the top, it's a dead body. It's not going up, it's not going down. You are trying to have a better understanding of, okay, I have an idea, I know more or less I'm what I'm doing, but at the same time, I'm too early to even get a customer. I'm too early to develop something, so it needs some time and energy to be able to bring you to the level that you would be able to see some proper progress. Then you go back to this growth intersection. This is not really the growth, but rather it's a dead body that you want to animate. This is where you would get your first customer. A lot of people come to you and I was like, how much do you have to pay to get your customer? The answer is always first customer or the millionth customer. Because you might have to pay a thousand dollar just to get one customer. Because that customer, you don't even know where it is. You might even have to pay them to use your product. But when you go further, and I was like, if you like Google, I mean, please, any one of you just try to contact customer service of Google and Facebook and then try to have a complaint that I don't like your product. Does exist. But I promise you, if you go back to them when they have 50 customers, Mark Zuckerberg would just come downstairs from his dormitory and then try to say, how can I help you? <laughs> so the growth stages are different. But in so many presentations, what you see as a startup, literally start from stage three to stage four. Everybody wants to be billionaires. Most of the time when you hear presentations for startups, they say that right now we have zero customers, but in five years, we're going to expect 10 to 20 million revenue per month. And they are totally ignoring the fact that you need time to prepare yourself. They are totally ignoring the fact that there are going to be hard times. I had somebody in the back that she said that I don't want to make my own startup. That's good. Startups are not for everyone. Startups are for people. They say having a startup is like chewing glass and pretend that you're enjoying it. <laughs> Remember that. Beginning is hard. I will give you a story of Amazon because we were talking about it as an example. Um, let's just imagine that there is a guy, he works in the financial sector. He makes a lot of money. His wife makes a lot of money. Sorry? He was very rich. Yes, thank you. And why do you want to change that? It's a great life. And now you go to your boss because they ask you to do a research on the next trends. And this gentleman finds this amazing new idea that is called internet. And he understands that with the power of internet, there is this brand new thing. You would be able to have exponential growth. And if you work in a hedge fund, you are always looking for the next big thing to invest. And then he wanted to put a case study. So he said that if you would be able to somehow digitize books, you'd be able to have more than 10,000% increase in your revenue. That's a lot of money. But they didn't buy it from him because that was too much and that was too out of this world. And he said that, you know what, I'm just gonna leave my job. Not only I'm gonna leave my job, I'm also gonna ask my wife to leave her job. Not only I'm gonna do that because it's so expensive where we live, we're also gonna relocate somewhere else. So if you think this is the beginning of Amazon, no. Nobody invested in the company. No one. Jeff's mom had a, he had a stepdad. He borrowed this money, that is a lot of money to him because he loved him. Nobody trusted him in his business, zero. No VCs, no hedge fund friends, no rich friends, zero. And now imagine that again you say that, oh my God, he was such a smart guy, he invested his money in the best company in the world. Now let's just see what happened. Way back, you could not just start your own WordPress startup, you know, like that you make a website in two minutes and then after that the servers are in AWS and everything is gonna be, no. You had to buy hardware that is expensive. You had to have people that they do programming, that they were very tiny amount of people that they were good at those things. Hired them, a lot of problems, and now the website of Amazon is up. 
What is the idea? You're not gonna have a warehouse. This lady wants to buy one book. We will sell her one book and we're just gonna call the person who is the publisher and is gonna give this book directly to you without any, again, I mentioned about a sort of democratization web page, right? That was great. Website was up, the first lady came and she wanted to buy one book. Super excited, we're gonna sell one book. First customer validation. First book sold, they called the distributor, they say that 10 books minimum. And then I was like, if for every book that I want to buy, I have to buy 10 more, then it means that even I have to have a bigger inventory than a normal bookstore, Much. then the idea is dead. So now you can imagine that Amazon again could die uh, during the break we were just talking about like, what would I do if I want to start my own idea? So let's forget about Amazon. You go back to your stepdad, apologize. I'm sorry, like I lost a million dollars. So I would just see what I can do about that. But they realize if you order a rare book that not even one copy of that exists in the inventory, you can order them and the book that they want, the sum is 10, and in the beginning you will be able to be fine. So they were literally manually, when you were order a book, they will manually try to order other books so that they will be able to do that till they become into a scale that they could and then they will have 10 people that they wanted to have the same book. And now it's a trillion dollar company. So a startup is not that from one day you're just going to all of a sudden have this breakthrough and everything is gonna be fine for you. I tried to make a roadmap for you as detailed as possible. And again, as I told you, it's not a copy paste of anything. I really tried to make it in a way that you have a very abstract understanding of where you start and where you finish. Ideation and validation. Whenever you would like to have a startup, the first thing that you have to do, and you guys have that, a pen and a paper. You literally have to sit down and definitely write exactly what you have in your idea. I meet a lot of people in the events outside in different places. I'm in university, I mean like, you know, like the, the, the startup events. It's like I have this idea I wanted to share with you. I was like, so I am here. I was like, it takes 20 minutes for me to talk about it. One, I don't have time. Two, when they are talking to you, you feel that they are improvising what the idea might be. It means that they never even write it in the first place for themselves. So try to document it as much as possible. Validation, please forget about talking to your mom. She loves you, whatever you do is great. You're the most beautiful person on earth. Everything you do is great, you're smart. Go there and do it, I have your back. Also the lunch is in the fridge. That is not gonna help you unless your product is just gonna be for your mom. You have to find a focus group. You have to find people that potentially, one more time, they are not smart, they are not uh, uh, industry experts, they are your customer. You have to find people that later when the idea is out, they are ready to put their hand in their pocket and pay for that service. Just to be clear, we can talk about sustainability, we can talk about nonprofit organizations, we can talk about impacts equivalent of that. I'm not really gonna go back to the impact dollar and how you can value it and impact startup, whole different conversation. Pretend that everything that I say right now is in the form of the commercial part of it because I have to generalize, otherwise it would be too complicated to move forward. Second, formation and foundation. One of the problems that you have, there is a new startup, you don't believe in it, your co-founder doesn't believe in it, and I was like, 50-50, brothers. And then this gentleman comes over and I was like, I'm gonna put a million dollar that's where the fight happens. That was my idea and I only brought you here because you're my good friend and you were only coming here and helping me on Thursdays. So 10% to you. And I was like, you said 50. And I was like, show me the proof. And then investor goes because they are legally people that they are in fight with each other over the intellectual property of the idea. So formation and the foundation sometimes is more important than your idea. I have friends. They started their idea at the university. Without an exaggeration, 30, 40% of the idea was a share of their teacher that they gave them like 10,000 zloty cash just to make the idea happen. And now this is a million dollar project. That professor never become rich because that's the valuation of the startup, not the money that it makes. So the guy didn't make money. He's still a guy, and please if you guys don't have any student, you know, teachers in your family, please ask them. You don't make a lot of money at university, so he has no money. And he's a major shareholder. 
And now a major investor wants to co-invest and you usually invest with your investor. So if that guy wants to put a million inside, he expect the other person for 10%. He expect the other person with 30% shares to at least put one and a half million. He doesn't even have 150,000 worth here, right? So in the beginning, it is important to know how you're putting the main ways to make your idea into an organization. We can definitely talk about founders agreement. It is harder than a marriage. But the reality is that you have to go through it. I would die, what would you like to do with the idea? You have a job that is gonna give you 100,000 per month. What would I do with the idea? We both want to sell the idea. Many people came to Mark Zuckerberg with million dollar over just an idea. I mean, it could easily die, but you say no. But the others will literally just say that you're crazy. Just sell it. You just work on it for six months. But what he will see is a billion dollar idea in the end. What they could see is a six month quick a million dollar in their pockets. You have to have this founder's agreement so that you have a better understanding that if you would really like to build a long lasting company, how the company is going to survive on a long run. After that, you go back to the seed stage and early funding. Remember, money comes from different sources. Later I will talk about it, but you should not go and say the money that you need till the end of the road. If you are really trying to make your idea, you have to say how much money I need just to show that I have a proof that what I'm about to do, sorry guys, I'm gonna have a small parenthesis here. I'm trying to not use any scientific terminologies or abbreviations that this is just a jargon inside industry. Plus, if there is something, you have your pen and paper, and I would stop before, and please just ask those questions. Not knowing something, it's not an issue. We're not here because we are all the startup experts and this is a symposium and I'm just going to talk about other PhDs, about my thesis on another PhD. So please don't forget, there's no such thing as a stupid question, there is no such thing as a bad question. Just don't mix comments with a question, that's a different thing, but if it's a question, it's always good. So going back, if you are having an idea, you have to have a minimum amount of money that can translate itself to the enough money that you can prove your idea, and you have to stick to that. Don't go and say, give me $500 million because I have a really good idea. And I was like, what do you have? And it was like a name and a paragraph that I can send to your email. So the seed stage, the first stage. Think of it as a tree that is gonna grow. This is the seed, this is the, you know, the, the small amount of uh, uh, effort that you have to put. And then after that, you go and try to do the development and the iteration. Guys, if you are in the world of a startup, there is this P word that we are never going to use. Perfect. Nothing in your startup is perfect. The founder of LinkedIn has this very famous sentence that if you are proud of your first product, you ship it too late. Remember that. You should not look for perfect. Everything can be better, everything can change. My presentations are not perfect. My presentations are good enough so that hopefully you understand what I'm about to say. The structure of this class is not perfect, but still, I iterated. I built something, I deleted it, I made it again, I started talking in front of people that they know more than me. Now I am confident enough to share it with you. That's the definition of what I'm showing you. But if that presentation had to be perfect, I would invite all of you in 2050 to tell you how startups had to look in 2024. That's the problem, right? Then you start with the market entry and growth. I intentionally put series A and the market entry and growth more or less in the same level, and I will explain. Some companies, they are biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, quantum computings. They are highly sophisticated ideas. The other company is just an e-commerce platform where you put your potatoes in it and then you would be able to just directly communicate the potato farmers and people who want to buy fries. The level of sophistication is different. A lot of people, I'll, I'll give you a real idea. Uh, you would like to help people to go out and eat together. And to make it happen, it's always hard, right? So like it's not dating, so you don't want to match people based on romantic ways. You just want to say who is up for a picnic together. 
Trust me, I've heard so many people pitching this idea to me because a lot of people have that problem. And then I was like, so what did you do? I have a pitch deck ready. I have MVP ready. I think we need a mobile app. We're gonna have two billion users. And I was like, yeah, but what did you do? And I was like, oh, we're working on the pitch deck. And I, was, I think we're like with $250,000 to be able to have a first prototype. And I was like, but that's not what I'm asking. Did you ever go out with five people that you don't know and you find? And I was like, no, but this is not how it works. Sometimes in order to show your idea, you don't need any code. You don't need to get those things. So the amount of the seed stage that I mentioned here, it can just be 50 zloty that you put on your picnic basket and then make a Facebook group and just bring those people to one time outside. And I was like, did you like it? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, do you have two friends? And I was like, yeah. So next time it's gonna be 15 people. Come to your investor with 500 people, with 1,000 people, that they like your picnics and they go out with you, and you say that right now my numbers is so much off the charts that manually I cannot make it further. Come and pay me. But if you go back with your hand in your pocket and just tell them that without 250,000 you cannot even bring one person to the picnic, they're not gonna pay you. I'm gonna go the other way around. I'm having a quantum computer that can break SHA-256 algorithm in two seconds. And I was like, show me your quantum computer, then I'm just gonna give you the money. This is not how it works. You need easily like $200 million just to show the MVP of it, right? I have a nano uh, protection that is going to be on top of the fruits, and this is going to help the, the, the uh, silos that they have grains to have 20% less uh, uh, rotten weeds in the bottom. It's a million dollar, if not a billion dollar idea. And I was like, okay, give me your nano uh, uh, covering technology and then I'm gonna give you the money. No, it needs 50 million R&D just to show you the first part. But why do they give you the money? Because you have a PhD. One girl was pitching me something in an international competition and she said that she knows how to predict earthquake. And I was like, one, nobody in the world can do that. Two, you're not a startupper. I have to have a PhD in geology so that I will be able to test your idea. Go to the university, they will give you the funding, right? So I just want to say that this part that is about the market entry and the AB and the next series of funding, it is complicated which one goes first. That's why I kind of put them in the same place. And don't worry about the numbers, just remember, if you bootstrap that you guys know what it means, that is not external funding. Also, the bootstrap, it means FFF, family, friends, and fools. These are the first people that you have to ask for money. If you are going and ask somebody outside, before you ask family, friends, and fools, they are not gonna give you the money. Yeah. Two, I love this. They said there were two neighbors, and uh, one neighbor went to the other one, just knocked on the door, and I was like, can I just borrow your scissor? And I was like, I mean, scissors something that everybody have. Like, why do you need my scissor? And I was like, you know, like, I want to cut a wire, but I think it's going to destroy my scissors, so it's going to find your scissor. <laughs> Guys, this is an honest pitch about 99% of startups. They come with their Lamborghini outside, and they say that I am in a desperate need of 50,000 zloty. <laughs> and I was like, you cannot change your tires with that amount of money. I was like, I know, but my idea is shit. <laughs> that's the honest feedback because the moment that you're sitting in your house the moment that you have the funding that you need and for six years you are asking for money that you're sitting on it VCs will understand that you don't believe in your idea so remember that part after you exhausted that money that you and families and friends have first round that you have is the seed money second round that you have is A and then it goes Technically, it's B and B plus, but trust me, especially during some bubbles, people went to D, E, and F, and then it moves forward. On top of that, in some countries, this is not exactly how it works because they usually put the name based on how much you raise. So there was a time that like more than a million was Series A, and then all of a sudden in Silicon Valley, the seed went around five million. So that's where this whole equation kind of just doesn't exist anymore because to an extent, you can say that like the rules change so much that then they decide first money is seed, next one is A, and then you just go alphabetically higher. Then scaling and operation. What does it mean? 
You have money for growth most of the time, either growth in your application, in your idea, or in your team, depending on what you want to have. Some people have idea that they would like to have a bigger team because they are a service company. Some people, they have a product. Some people just have everything they have, like Revolut, that they left, uh, uh, that they need just to go to different countries. We also will talk about scale versus a startup. That is a different story for the later. Then market leadership and expansion. You are having a full scaling, you are having the right team, and now what you do is that you say you would like to dominate the Polish market. How many of you guys know Too Good To Go? Nice. So Too Good To Go is a company that they just try to help you, for example, like with your food waste. Great company. They didn't come to Polish market. Foodsy copied their idea, made it perfect for the local market. They got a huge chunk of the market. That's your problem. So you have to have this sweet spot. When am I going to go to my next market? Because if I don't, then another company, I do all of the trouble. I come up with an idea that nobody has, but it does not stop me that nobody in the world is going to do what I do. If you guys know Rocket Internet, that is their bread and butter. That's what they do. You have Amazon, I make the Amazon of Africa. You have Booking.com, I make the Booking.com of somewhere else. You have the Uber, I make the Uber somewhere else. Because if you do not go global, somebody else is going to take your margin. After that, the strategic partnership and acquisition. You are the biggest company in the world. Still, if you manage to partner with Visa and MasterCard and Apple and Samsung and so on and so forth, then not only you are going to be bigger, you're also going to go into a market that did not even exist before you do it, right? You're in post, you're doing something great, and then all of a sudden you also partner up with another company that they always needed a locker for their business. So just a small partnership all of a sudden give you the same amount of customers that you had just by being without them. Second part, IPO. Remember guys, uh, one of you guys had an exit, but exit doesn't mean anything. Exit means that I failed. Honestly, because even if you do chapter 11, if you just literally just say that I'm bankrupt, you exited your startup. You can sell your startup with the right price. If Mark Zuckerberg would sell Facebook with a million dollar, in, in a million dollar, in the dormitory of Harvard, he would be a famous guy who sold the company for a million dollar. Fast forward in another reality, even a billion dollar was a success. Fast forward, that's the wrong decision. But at some point, every startup has to have an exit strategy. One of the most common exit strategies is an initial public offering. Meaning that there is a time that I'm a shareholder of this company, and if this lady wants to buy my shares, and if this gentleman wants to buy my shares, we have to talk. But the moment that I say that my shares are going to be publicly available for everybody else, then every one of you can wake up and say that I am a big fan of the Witcher, so I'm going to buy the shares of the City Project Red because I believe in the idea. You don't have to go and talk to the founders and it's like, you know, please have 2% shares of your company. And then their success and their failure is yours. So IPO is a very special part of your star because this is the point that you still kind of have your company, but then the to an extent, you lose the control, but the future of your company belongs to a lot of people, not just yourself. But remember, this is not the end of the road. Then you have the post-exit transition and integration. Even if you sell your company, still you have to see you're selling it to another person, you're selling it to another organization, it's the merger and acquisition, so you are right now, you're still a part of your startup, but you're a part of another company. Instagram had an exit. WhatsApp had an exit. But it doesn't mean that they are not working anymore. They are just going through a transition and integration with Meta, back then Facebook. So a lot of companies, even after an exit, they are still a big success because they are still merging with a bigger organization. But even that is not the end. Then you have the legacy and impact. You can see a company that even though that they exited, even though that they don't exist, they change something that right now they changes everything for everyone. Uh, before impost was in Poland, Poczta Polska was the only way you could send things to people on a one-to-one -one basis. But the moment that you go and try to just say, one of the things that I like, again, user experience, that again, we talk about it later, 
how many seconds it takes for you to be interacting with uh, impulse? 30 seconds. Yeah. Watch the postcode, it takes 30 seconds to open the door. So even if you exit, even if you really feel that I am no longer even the owner of my startup, you have a legacy and impact. You changed everything in the ecosystem around you. And just remember, the reason that I put them at these steps is because, as I told you, this is that phase research uh, that, that I mentioned at the beginning. These are your own footsteps. If you talk to Rafa with Impost, if you talk to Stefan and Booksy, they did not follow anybody else's path. But the beauty is that when everybody wants to make the next Uber, everybody makes the next Airbnb, because they see these footsteps from the idea, you can just easily Google the pitch of Uber. You can look at the pitch of Airbnb. You can see their investments. You can see their scaling. You can see their growth. You can see their strategy. So you become more and more of a small and medium enterprise, but you still call yourself a startup because you see a very powerful, very innovative inventors. They went their way, and now you just follow their path and become successful. There's nothing wrong with it. Just don't call yourself a startup. Because people that they are usually doing a startup, they are not following anybody else's path. They are those anomalies. They are the people that they say, you know what? What if I have a spare room, and I am a person that I am so much in need of money, meaning that most probably I'm not the most trustworthy person in the world. I am also thinking that maybe I can just ask somebody to pay for my other room. And no guarantees. That's a great idea, right? I mean, it's crazy. I was like, how do you even think anybody wants to come to your place? People go to a hotel. People barely go to a motel because that's not safe. That's Airbnb. You grow up, your mom would just tell you, don't ever go to the car of strangers, okay? Second, don't take candies from them. Now you go to Uber. You are so proud of yourself, you don't even know who the guy is. And I was like, would you like to have some candies? And I was like, that is literally everything my mom said not to do. These are billion dollar companies. But remember, the next time you try to do what they do, you're following a path of somebody else. There is a long dispute right now between Lyft and Uber, that who started first and who started second. Because they are proud of the fact that they were the one who searched the way. They were the one who paved the way. Bolt is a whole different story. Bolt has one unique selling proposition. Nobody in Estonia had a problem with fighting against the taxi industry. They were super comfortable. And it was like, you want a big technology? E in Estonia is for electronics. Come over and do it. They did it super fast. Caveat, they grow super fast. They've been to $30 billion valuation. Less than a month ago, they had a different valuation, 300 million. Also remember, when you are following somebody as a path, super fast, you might have fast growth and fast down. So, guys, as I mentioned, I will send you the video, I will send you material, because a lot of things that they are happening here, it's too much to digest in one session. So I will have a small recap from the beginning till where we are right now. We're going to have eight separate sessions together, that every two of them, they are combined so that we can somehow have not a balance of only two hours with the content, but four hours, so that whenever we finish the first part of that, we can come back to the next session and then follow up on that. I hope everybody is scanned at your code. I would send an email so that you would be not only connected to me, but also internally connected. Because trust me, even sometimes the questions and the communications that internally you can have together might be as valuable. We would like to, by the definition, be the ecosystem that I mentioned here. And then after that, every single time, when there was a problem, there is a Q&A, there is a communication with the email on my side, so that there will be a little bit of more support on your side. If I would be very straightforward with you, the biggest out of this session for you is you know what you don't know, and you're confident that what you know is scientific. It's not based on a TikTok video or a 30 second of a person who just knows about another video. A lot of YouTube videos are a copy of another YouTube video. And if you really follow that, the first person who made it just found it from Wikipedia. right? So just remember that a lot of content that you consume might be wrong. 
I am not here to have a gotcha session and show you all the big scientific issues that you see, unfortunately, in the media, but trust me, that is there. So, these are the elements of the startup ecosystem. And going back to our student friends that they were saying that they're not a part of the startup ecosystem. Startups are the biggest entity. How can you have a startup ecosystem without a startup? But remember, startups are not a class of companies. You cannot go to a legal organization, say, I don't want to have a limited liability company. I don't want to have a Spooka Zoo. I don't have a Have SA. I don't have a PSR. I want to have a startup. It doesn't exist in most countries. So a startup is a state of mind, per se, if you can just put it that way. But still, you have to have a startup qualified with everything that I said. Second, founders and entrepreneurs. Not everybody is made to be a leader. It's not a problem. You have to own who you are. Some of you might be introverts, some of you might be extroverts. If somebody is not very good at saying who they are and what they do, don't be ashamed of yourself. You are an introvert and own it. It's perfect. 90% of the programmers don't even want to talk to their colleague. But leave them in front of their laptop till 3 a.m. they work. And also they troll other people on the other side of the world as if like they are the most extroverted people because they're extroverted on the laptop. But if you see them face to face, they don't even know how to say hi to you. So be yourself. Entrepreneurs have to be leaders, guys. Steve Jobs hired a CEO because he was a good visionary, but he was not the good CEO at that moment. And when the time came, he became the guy, right? So remember, find your place in this ecosystem and be that person. You can even be the owner of the idea and find a person who is way better, way more eloquent, way more uh, uh, extrovert, way more like a networker, and then try to have that person there. Investors, lots of different ways. I will tell you a fun fact that is pretty interesting. Angel investors came from movie industry. There were people in Broadway that they would just say that you're a great actor, I believe in you, and I will be an angel and I will give you a thousand dollar so that you will be able to rent this place and have your show for two more months and then we will see how much money we're gonna get out of the tickets of that. They were investing in an idea that nobody else believed in it. That's why they were an angel and we give them the money. Venture capital are people that they are venturing on their money. They are risking it. So a company that takes no risk for the money that they give to startups, they're just borrowing you the money or they have zero venture in their capital. So remember, these things matter. If a company says that if you do not give me the money by the next three years, they are not a VC just because the name of the VC is inside their name, right? The only good news for you is that unlike a startups, venture capitals are highly regulated entities that they are being audited. So you are a little bit safe, but you are not safe because you don't know the law. You are not safe because you are not a person that when you sign under 30, 40, especially if you're in the US, 500 pages of legal agreement, that you don't know that regardless of the outcome of your startup, you have to pay that money back somehow. So you have to be careful. How many of you know venture capital or have heard of the venture capital? Good. How many of you cannot raise your hand, Russell? Uh, how many of you know venture debt? That's one of the big problems, right? You don't always have to do venture capital. As I told you, if you have a house, if you have an entity, you don't have to give shares away. You can just go to a venture debt. They give you the money and in five years, they just you pay them back with an interest. If you believe in your shares, never give your shares away because giving shares away is literally giving the responsibility to someone else, is giving the control to someone else. Elon Musk was being out of his own company because he wanted to make PayPal a company of everything. And then another founder, just say that, no, we're making a lot of money out of payment and we're gonna be only a payment company. You don't have enough shares, you go on a vacation for the first time with your wife, you're out of the company. So remember, there are lots of different ways and we talk about it in detail how you can try to make that money. On top of that, incubators and accelerators. A lot of times you try to learn everything by yourself. My metaphor of YouTube, right? Five minutes, how to bake a cake. And now you say that, okay, so for my wedding, I'm just gonna make my own cake. How? Because I watched it for five minutes. That's how a lot of people wanna make startups. You need acceleration in many cases. Some accelerations are just watering down something that can be done in two days, but some of them are really good. You learn how to do a business model, you learn how to talk to investors, you know what legal factor is. We're having a hackathon, and we were talking about 
different people you need in the team. There was this nice lady, she was a lawyer, and she was saying all the startups say that they don't need me because I'm not necessary. And I was like, guys, it's not about your code. If you don't know that what you do is legal or illegal, everything you do doesn't matter. If Revolut wants to come to one country or the other, first person that has to be there is not a business developer, is a lawyer. Am I legally allowed to be in this place? Is a financial ecosystem allowing me to do this or not, right? So you have to know all of those things, and incubators and accelerators to a good extent can help you with all of those bits and pieces. University and research institutes. In, university, in, in Zurich, most people that they want to have a startup, they contact the university. Because the university has a research center, they are having professors that they are literally from the market, they help you. So remember that not all the time, also the answer to what you want to have is inside the startup ecosystem as what the general public are talking about that. Governments and policymakers, you obviously know we talk about the policy and, and all the rules that they are important to that. We talked about corporate partnership. A lot of time you try to develop an application that a corporate partner needs it from the first place. Super important. Media organizations, huge problem here. A lot of us, we have a problem because we do something great, but we don't talk about it. There is no press release. There is nobody that knows exactly what we're doing. So also remember that you have to have a proper connection to all of these elements so that you would be able to go where you really want to go. Infrastructure. If you are trying to build a road, if you are trying to build something that needs financials, financial backing, needs banking, needs digital banking, Poland has one of the best payment solutions in the world. If you go to US and then try to show them that you go to Zabka and with one penny you can use the app, for them they think that you came from future. These things does matter and these are super important to know if you are in a country, what are the infrastructures that are needed there? Service providers. I want to have a payment solution. There's a company that can help me. I don't have to make it. I want to have a delivery. There's another company that can help me. Talent pool. Guys, remember, talent is super important. If you're a student, you're the backbone of a startup. Startups go where the talent is. A lot of companies are leaving Silicon Valley because they drained the talent there. If you want to work, right now in a big company in Silicon Valley, first is that you have to have a name of 10 people that potentially can work in this company. You have to write their name here. And I was like, I have 10 friends, can I write their name? I was like, no, we hired you and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Because here you have the abundance of those people, but the other side, so talent is super important for the startup ecosystem. Customers and markets. Also remember, if you are developing an application in Poland and all of your customers are in Chile, you might not be the most successful person here. Culture and community. While you guys were on the vacation, we're literally just talking about the culture. You go to Spain, you go to Switzerland. Great people, but they don't let foreigners, outsiders, to enter the local market. They are super yes. strict. Then you go to Poland, and in five minutes, number one, you leave one Thursday gathering with 50 best friends, and then they say, hey, I have five things for you, come to my place, and from tomorrow you're gonna work for my brother. The culture changes everything. The moment that people welcome others and the moment that people somehow have an understanding that even though you're not really from here, I will be able to somehow welcome you, it makes a big difference for everybody. Events and networking. Also remember, what you think you know, you can always just go and hear to other, other, what other people are saying. Try to just connect with the right people. Sometimes it's small consulting, sometimes a small idea that comes from other people can totally change what you do. Be generous with your idea and share it as much as possible with other people. And success stories and role models. As a joke, I was uh, teaching in a university in Poland, and I would say 80% of my uh, students were girls, and one of them said that the reason that we cannot be successful in Poland is because we don't have a successful role model for ourselves. And I was like, you have a Marie Curie that was literally living in a city center of Warsaw, two Nobel Prizes, and if this is not enough of a role model for you, then I don't know who in the world has a role model for you, right? So sometimes we are just saying that we cannot be successful because we just need an excuse to not to be successful. But also remember, Estonia became a hub for startups just because Skype as one company became successful. And a loyal company, because they went back with Atomico, started investing the money where they come from. 
Because also you can imagine a lot of companies, they become very successful in one place, but they totally detach themselves and they go to another market and they say that our success belongs to somewhere else. So role models are super important, guys. I would try to do one question, and you guys have a pen and paper, so uh, if you don't mind, uh, don't write your email, don't write your name, write your email, because I wanna just put it uh, next to the email, and then come here and give it to me, and then for the person that can write it properly, I will give that person a ticket to the Techstars uh, Startup Weekend. I think it's like a hundred and something, so you need to check it online. So, what do you think? Thank you everyone for joining us. 30 seconds. Yeah. It, but, uh, make so, what is the last stage in the startup roadmap that it was in the presentation? So, just write it down on a piece of paper, and you can come over and give it to me. And then, just to be clear, guys, for the guys, because some of you came a little bit later, there is a QR code. If you scan that QR code, you will receive the video of this and at the same time some more links so that you would be able to internally connect it with others. Try to be in other parts because there is a continuity in the material. And the moment that you manage to go through all of it, then you would be able to have a better understanding of what is happening. Let me just go quickly to the last slide uh, so that you would be able to also have the contacts in case that you would like to have it. So make sure that you do have the QR code scanned because otherwise you're not going to receive the material. And based on the email that you have also on this piece of paper, I will be able to send you the ticket for the event. With that, I would like to say thank you very much for spending a very long time of your Thursday here and looking forward to seeing all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you.